Welcome to the Brent Clinical Psychology Channel. I'm Dr. Anna Georgiadis. And I'm Dr. Paul Boyden. And we're clinical psychologists at the Brent Clinical Psychology Service. So today I'm going to be interviewing Paul just to find out a little bit more about borderline personality disorder, otherwise known as BPD, so we can understand a little bit more about what it looks like and what brings it about in the first place. So Paul, could you say a little bit more about it? Yeah, so BPD stands for borderline personality disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, and people who have a diagnosis of this term might also use other phrases such as emotional sensitivity or it might be a term that's used to describe people who really struggle with mm -hmm. emotion dysregulation. Okay. Um, you ask what causes it. So um, people who have been given this diagnosis or have these difficulties in life often report that their environment at home growing up was quite invalidating. So the invalidating environment, what that means is when someone, especially as a child, has an emotion that isn't matched with any kind of response of validation, empathy, or even recognition, that invalidation in itself leads the person to not know what the emotion is, what it's called, what to do, what's going to happen next, and how to manage that. So are you saying when our emotions are kind of dismissed and ignored in a way, is that what uh, invalidation is? Yeah, that's right. So, for example, if someone were to go to school and they come home from school that day mm -hmm. and they have had a really difficult day and they tell their parents, you know, I'm incredibly angry that I failed an exam mm -hmm. or I'm frustrated or someone hurt my feelings, whether that was through bullying mm -hmm. or a comment was made by a teacher, then we would expect the parents to validate, to say, oh, that sounds really difficult or mm -hmm. you must be very sad or you must be upset. Yeah. And then to try and give that person some empathy and then eventually after some time also suggest what can we do to, to regulate, regulate the emotion. Mm. And just on the opposite, out of curiosity, what effect does validation actually have on the person? So for validation, it's, um, it's a basic human interaction from a transaction between someone and another person. Mm. Um, and validation will uh, enable you to think, actually my emotions are normal, um, this is how I'm meant to be feeling, to label the emotion, to know what sensations in the body might be arising when you have that emotion, how might you think about it, and how might you appraise the world or see the world or see that interaction with the person. Um, and also, more importantly, it sends a message to the brain that the emotion is okay, it's temporary, it will pass, and it's normal. Okay, so it's a sense that uh, it, it might help people start to label their emotions, feel them, and maybe not be so fearful of their emotions? Absolutely, yeah. So to not have a better understanding of what they are. Mm. And you were mentioning about invalidating environments. Does trauma fit into this at all? Yeah. So to be invalidated again and again on a consistent basis, or even to have nobody there to even recognise you, to, to validate you anyway, that in itself is traumatic. Mm. And for people um, with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, they will often say that there is also other trauma that might have happened in life. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned, it could be bullying, or it could be other traumas such as sexual abuse, it could be physical harm, it could be um, road traffic accidents, it could be multiple traumas. Mm -hmm. And to have a trauma like that and then not be validated afterwards is, is twice the emotional pain. Mm -hmm. The emotional intensity is twice as difficult mm -hmm. because to not be validated after having a trauma is a secondary trauma. Yeah. So that's extremely difficult, and that's why it can lead, um, lead people with all sorts of difficulties when they're growing up or later on in life um, when it comes to emotions. You mentioned different types of trauma. Would neglect, physical or emotional neglect, also fit in with that, with that kind of category of trauma? Yeah, it can be any kind of trauma. And a trauma is often you know, an experience where people think that um, their life is in imminent danger. Um, or that uh, there is a threat to their survival. Mm. And that was the next thing I was going to ask. What about like the idea that maybe our home is supposed to be a sanctuary, a place of safety, and yeah. this sense of maybe treading on eggshells or feeling under threat, does that play a role in, in this borderline personality uh, yeah. difficulty? Yes, because if the person doesn't have a place of safety in their home, then that sense of threat will be constant, will be strong, and will carry on for quite some time. So when we think about what we know about trauma and threat, um, there will be an emotional response, a physiological response, but also there will be an interaction with the brain as well. So the brain chemistry can change. So there's something in the brain called the amygdala, which is um, otherwise known as the fear centre. Um, and if someone has been under threat and is not met with um, validation or comfort or a sense of safety after that, 
and it is constantly always in terms of that, then the brain will often, um, the, the amygdala will misfire. Mm -hmm. So it will feel as if there's always danger around the corner and that will lead you to having to feel constantly on guard that there could always be something bad that's going to happen. So is it a sense that the amygdala is like overfiring, it's overactive because yeah. they've almost been trained to be constantly under a sense of threat? Yeah. That it's, does that uh, continue into adulthood though? It can do, yeah, absolutely, of course it can. And um, for a lot of people who feel that their brain is constantly under threat and is overfiring, even though there's no reason for it to, um, it can be activated by all sorts of things in adulthood. So it could be a relationship, it could be um, an experience of such as missing the bus, for example. Mm -hmm. It can just feel as if the brain is always overfiring and that the emotions that come um, when something negative happens, mm -hmm. or even positive, can be very, very intense and mm -hmm. very difficult to regulate. And say compared to the general population, uh, would individuals who've had kind of early difficult experiences of evaluation, would that affect how they respond to daily stress? Like you said, missing the bus, would that be different to other people who haven't had this trauma? Yeah, absolutely. Some people might sort of say, I know it's a very small thing, and that while I'm talking about it with you now, with hindsight, I can see that it was a tiny thing, but in the moment, the emotional intensity I felt when I missed the bus or, you know, I, I didn't pass my driving test, for example, was extremely high, and that led me to having, you know, a lot of emotions that I didn't know how to regulate and I didn't know how to cope. So I might then find other ways to cope that might actually be more harmful and might make the situation worse. Mm. And that's what I wanted to ask next in terms of what are the main categories that might describe the experiences of someone that has this label or experience of borderline personality disorder, what, what are the main categories or features? Yeah, so under the five of those, um, the first one is um, something I've mentioned already, which is emotion dysregulation. Uh, the second one is interpersonal dysregulation. And um, the third one is cognitive dysregulation. The fourth one is a sense of um, a lack of identity, so self dysregulation. Okay. And then the fifth one is the behavior dysregulation, so what happens in terms of how do we behave? What do we do in response to all of this? Okay. Could you uh, explain a little, a little bit more about each of those categories and what that might look like? Yeah, sure. So, um, emotional dysregulation is kind of where our emotions can be up and down, can be quite liable. So it can be a rapid change. It can be a high intensity, mm -hmm. and emotions might change from hour to hour, from minute to minute. So it could even be that there's a range of emotions displayed within one day, mm -hmm. um, but also those emotions might hang around for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. So the emotional intensity intensity will be quite extreme, they'll hang around for a while, and then the emotions take quite a long time to come back to baseline. Wow. And that, that those emotions can be anything, but often people say that anger can be one of those, but other emotions might be guilt, shame, sadness, joy. So lots of intense emotions, and can they fluctuate as well? Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned a second category? Yeah, so the second category would be cognitive dysregulation. Okay. So this is kind of where people might um, experience, so the trauma, the sense of threat um, is so high that the brain has to find a way to cope. And one of the ways that the mind does that is to dissociate. So often people say, I've had a conversation with someone, but I cannot remember anything about it. Or my journey from here to there, I don't, I can't think anything, I don't know where I was, I wasn't there, I know I was there. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like a like left the body. Okay. And this this term dissociation is is this a way of the body trying to protect itself? What what's yeah. going on here? Yeah. So the anxiety or the sense the state of stress is so high that the body to cut to cope is just to dissociate, to cut off from it completely because the intensity is just extremely unbearable. Okay. Um, and another one, another experience that people sort of say is that they might have a, a sense of suspiciousness and paranoia. So a distrust of other people, not really knowing if other people can be trusted or whether other people might be perceiving them in a certain way. It might not quite be exactly what's going on, but because of past experiences, it makes sense that people might experience that and hearing that. And is that only during periods of high emotional arousal or intensity? Usually, yes. It normally is when people's um, sense of, um, the stress levels are quite high. That can happen, yeah. And the, I'm feeling... Um, just very uncomfortable and you know very unsure. So, for example, people might be nipping to the shop and they're just not feeling themselves and just feeling like there's a suspiciousness. Or it could be in a more intense interpersonal romantic relationship, for mm -hmm. example, where 
we might just not be able to fully trust that the other person has got their best intentions at heart. Okay. Okay. And uh, the third category you mentioned? Yeah. So the third one was the um, the the sense of um, interpersonal interpersonal mm -hmm. um, dysregulation. So mm -hmm. this is where um, people might just be in difficulties in saying no to other people. Okay. Or it might be uh, a lack of um, confidence in being assertive or trying to get your needs met because we all have needs and we all need them to be met. Um, but to be able to do that skillfully and to keep the respect for the other person might be really difficult. So some people might demand things or sort of pay rises or wanting an appointment tomorrow and if you don't do that then I'm going to really struggle. But the thing is to ask for that we have to have the skill to be able to do that effectively. And we want to be able to do it in a civilised way where we respect the relationship with each other but hold on to the respect for ourselves as well. So that, that requires a set of skills that might be really difficult to develop growing up if we've never been taught. Mm. And this interpersonal difficulties, is, does that only just happen in, in say romantic relationships or does it extend to friendships and workplace and other settings as well? Absolutely, yeah. It could be um, difficulties at work with the colleagues, it could be um, difficulties with communicating with healthcare professionals, um, it could be friendships, um, it can be arranged basically any human relationship. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the fourth category? So the fourth category was around um, self dysregulation. So a lot of people with um, borderline personality disorder say, uh, you know, growing up, I never really got a sense of who I am, mm. or I don't know what my identity is, because no one's ever really sort of given me that kind of feedback. Mm. And if the feedback from others about who we are is always been negative, absent, not even there, or in incredibly critical, or making us feel a lot of disgust or shame or guilt, um, then the sense of identity is going to be extremely negative. So what we have to do is we have to really focus on what are our strengths, what are we good at, mm. what are our skills, or what do we want our life to be like? How do we build up a life that's worth living? Mm, that must be really difficult, maybe not having a sense of identity of who we are. I can imagine people feeling maybe a bit lost. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how would that, does that show in any way? Are, are people feeling confused or uncertain about themselves? Is there self-doubt? I don't know. Yeah. How, how does that self-identity um, affect people's lives? Yeah, yeah. So people might sort of say, I really don't know what what the point of living is. I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and often the, the trap could be feeling stuck as in, I'm waiting for my problem to get better and then I'm going to live the life that I want to. And I think the argument here is actually, well, no, let's try and work out what it is you want to get better for so that it really motivates you. So you can think about, actually, this is what I love about life and this is what I want to do and this is what I've always wanted to do and I might now have the time to try and you know, go towards those goals or my values in life. And I guess there's an important point of not almost invalidating what people have gone through. It sounds like yeah. you know people have probably gone through a lot of trauma and a lot of difficult experiences. Yeah. But saying despite those things, we can still have a life worth living. We absolutely. can still have something to look forward to. Yeah. So it's like a hopeful message. Yeah, absolutely, always, and that and that's exactly what we set out to do in psychology. Yeah. And the the final category, the fifth category. Yeah. So the fifth category is the. The behaviour, the things we do, mm -hmm. so behaviour dysregulation, um, what that really means is that some people will have found ways to cope in the short term mm -hmm. that really work, but in the long term it doesn't work. So for example, that can be um, impulsively doing something to try and get rid of the emotion. Mm -hmm. So people often might struggle with substance misuse, so drugs or alcohol, because that will change the emotion quite quickly and quite rapidly. But of course that isn't a long term solution mm -hmm. and it can sometimes cause more harm than good. Mm -hmm. Other people might find that they struggle with eating, um, or it could be that people might have sexualized behaviours that are unsafe. Um, and other people use all sorts of other forms of self injury such as cutting or burning. And the primary function of this is to try and get rid of the emotion or to feel something different, um, or to feel numb, to feel nothing. So the behaviours that follow those emotions might be um, something that people might need a bit more extra support with, mm. or who want to change that. Would like uh, expensive spending sprees fit into that in any way? Those kind of impulsive behaviours or doing something that's addictive, uh, yeah. even cigarettes. W w would any of that fit in with this? It can be, you know, if that's someone you want. To, uh, that could be something somebody wants to change. Um, but when you, yeah, like spending sprees is a really good example of what someone wanting to feel better. Mm. It feels good to spend money, but why wouldn't I spend money um, all the time? 
but of course the problem with that is how much money does the person have or even gambling like yeah. the, like a behavioral addiction in some way Absolutely. would that possibly fit under this yeah of course yeah because there would be a short-term sense of satisfaction or you know uh, there'll be a gaining of some kind of positive emotion with gambling mm. it's just the long term so it almost sounds like whatever the behavior is if it's done to it's almost done to change a feeling that's difficult or intense yeah. into something either to, to cut off or, or to change the emotion but in the long term it's probably not that helpful yeah definitely yeah, yeah. so what psychological treatments are available for borderline personality disorder yeah so there's a range of um, psychological treatments um um, all these psychological treatments have been shown to really help someone who's got this diagnosis to get to a point where they feel like they can recover. Okay. And recovery is very different for everybody. Everyone has a very different definition of recovery, and that's how it should be. It should be an individual um, you know, definition that we're going to be working with. Mm -hmm. So there's a range of different psychological treatments, and that's taught in therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, so for example, there's something called mentalization-based therapy, mm -hmm. so that's MBT. There's another therapy called psychodynamic therapy, um, the cognitive analytic therapy, um, and the one that um, you and I have done a lot of videos around has been DBT, dialectical behaviour therapy. Um, and just to talk about DBT specifically, we know that that's the number one choice of treatment in a range of countries um, who have the equivalent of best evidence guidelines, or in the UK we call them NICE guidelines for the NHS. Um, we know that there's 37 randomised controlled trials, RCTs, um, who, that they've all shown that people um, with a range of difficulties, so yes, borderline personality disorder, but also eating difficulties, substance misuse, um, have found that DBT can really help people to get life work with them. Wow, so it sounds like there's quite an evidence base for DBT, but there are other approaches that can be helpful too. Yeah, absolutely. And can people with this diagnosis or label um, of BPD recover? Is there a hope for, for people with these difficulties? Yeah, recovery looks different for absolutely everybody, like I said, but um, we know that it does work and the evidence is there to suggest that people do recover. Um, some people get to the point where they feel like the the term borderline personality disorder doesn't really fit them anymore um, and other terms might be better or it might be that people have actually got the support they needed and it might take a long time for some people they might need lots of different support and it could be a range of different things mm. but yeah absolutely people with BPD can recover. Fantastic so that's really hopeful that there is a treatment package available and people can, in effect, remove the diagnosis eventually if they commit to the treatment. It, it, it must be an intensive treatment. Could you say a little bit about what, what's involved? Yeah, with DBT, for example, yeah. um, to be honest with all those therapies I mentioned, they're normally not short-term therapies because to really work on all of those five difficulties I mentioned earlier, it's going to take a bit of time to build up a um, trust in relationship and good rapport with the therapist. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to take some time to change behaviours or to, to learn the skills and in DBT, we say that people with this diagnosis might have a deficit of skills. They might not have any of the coping strategies to be able to cope with their cognitive difficulties of um, suspicion or to regulate their emotions or to handle distress mm -hmm. um, when in a crisis. Um, so DBT is there to try and teach people those skills as we go along um, because a lot of people might not have had anybody in their life to teach them those skills, never mind to even just invalidate them. Fantastic. And is there anything else that would be helpful about the definition of borderline personality disorder or anything else that would be helpful for our viewers to, to know about? I think it's um, really good to sort of remember that um, in therapy you've got to identify, uh, in therapy or on your own after reflecting after watching this video, what are your strengths, what are your skills, what are you good at? Remember those, what are the good things about your personality, mm -hmm. rather than going straight to what, what the difficulties I have. Because um, a lot of people I work with have lots of skills, lots of good senses of humour, for example, mm. or a wonderful ability to have good empathy, mm. uh, to be able to help other people, or maybe even to be able to have a good um, sense of, you know, what's going on in the world and what would be really good in terms of society. Mm. Uh, it's a whole range of different positive traits, mm. and I think it's incredibly important to try and remember what those are and draw on those as mm. well. 
because I guess we might get stuck in a pattern of looking at all the challenges and sometimes yeah. we forget about our resilience, what helps us bounce back from times of stress or difficulty or yeah. adversity yeah. and trying to connect with others as well that are important to us and connecting maybe with our values as well. Yeah, and people can change and people learn to go you know, and you feel all the time mm -hmm. whether you have this diagnosis or not, everybody needs skills and help and support. Fantastic. So I just want to say thank you so much. And I just want to say thank you so much to our viewers. Uh, we really hope that this video will be helpful. Um, and um, until the next video, take care and bye-bye. Thank you.